This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview, my 200th. I am starting a new series on philosophers. The first up is Jacques Derrida. I have two experts on the man, and the conversation will begin in a moment. Jacques Derrida, I've been corrected, is the correct uh, way to pronounce the name. Uh, I had uh, mispronounced it in the intro, so uh, Derrida. Uh, I have two uh, people here, uh, Gil Anadra and Mitchell Stevens. They have both written of the man and his life. Uh, as I usually like to do, I want to get a little background, though, uh, about the people that I'm speaking to. So uh, let me start with Gil, uh, since you're on the left. Uh, if you could give me a little background about who you are, anything you've written about Derrida, and uh, so forth. Um, well, I teach, um, I, I should begin by saying I'm not a philosopher, but I teach um, in the Department of Religion and in the Department of Middle East, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University. Um, I have um, gotten to work with Derrida in the um, late 90s, uh, editing an anthology of his writings on religion. Um, which is the topic that I suppose I can claim some kind of expertise on. I'm not entirely sure, but um, so that's um, that's me. Okay. Well, as I said uh, before we started, uh, I do want to uh, get into some of his ideas uh, beyond just language, which he's most noted for. Mitchell Stevens is my other guest. Mitchell, uh, if you could give a little background about yourself and anything that you have written on the man. Yeah, I'm a. I'm even less of a philosopher, although I've written a lot about philosophy. I'm a journalism professor in the Carter Institute at New York University. Uh, my most recent book is uh, is called The Voice of America, and it's a biography of Lowell Thomas, a 20th century American journalism and his role in the invention of what we call traditional journalism. But for uh, quite a while, I assigned myself to what I saw as the idea of figuring some of these changes in uh, the academic world and the intellectual world were being uh, severely un underreported in American journalism at the time, pre-web. And, uh, and as part of that, I started doing profiles of some philosophers. Uh, one was uh, Habermas, and, uh, and actually I wrote two profiles of Derrida, one for the Los Angeles Times Magazine and one for the New York Times Magazine. And, uh, you know, and therefore had the pleasure of meeting him and reading him and uh, discussing his work with a lot of people uh, who were really uh, expert on it. Well, uh, I will link to both of your uh, university web pages uh, below this video so people, after they've uh, watched this video, could uh, either contact you or just find out more about you if they wish. Uh, I know that French names, uh, I'm a poet, so uh, a lot of times I've gotten into many arguments with people. Well, a lot of people who are French speakers have corrected me about Artur Rimbaud or Rimbaud, depending on the dialect or whatnot. There's about a half a dozen pronunciations of that name, so I know that that can be a little tricky in English. But let me uh, uh, start with the man himself. Uh, well, let, let me actually start with what he's most famous for, and just uh, we'll, we'll go back to who the man was. When the name Derrida comes up, uh, certainly ideas of deconstruction, post-structuralism, uh, and all of these big polysyllabic words come up uh, and that can oftentimes be off-putting to people who are, are looking to investigate uh, the man. Can, can we uh, sort of uh, talk a little bit about what his impact on uh, the idea of language in the 20th century was and what some of these terms actually mean versus what we often in, the, in, in uh, general life misconstrue them as uh, things like deconstruction, postmodernism, post-structuralism, etc. So uh, maybe Mitchell, if you want to start. Yeah, well, you know, approaching these matters as journalists, I was looking for the headlines and the chain of it, and it, it was really uh, fascinating to me to see uh, that something had happened after modernism. Uh, now all these uh, all these lines are of course tremendously uh, fuzzy, but I became very interested in modernism and, and postmodernism and post structuralism, and uh, uh, kind 
kind of as necessary and defined and less like uh, you know a, a modern building uh, and, and more complicated. And I, you know, from my point of view, uh, Derrida was simply one of the main, if not the main, figure in uh, in, in in working some of this stuff out. In, in realizing that there was no straight, clear line that could be drawn through an argument, for example. That uh, that language has a tendency to get tangled, to even contradict itself. Uh, you know, that when we're when we're we're making our strongest point, for example, and this is, you know, the classic Derrida example, when we're uh, trying to say as Plato does, why speech is so much better than writing, so much more real, more direct, more ideal. Writing, we tend to, uh, uh, we fall back on formulations as Plato did by saying that speech is written in our souls. We tend to use the thing we're trying to distinguish it from to make the point, and, and therefore our thoughts are not nearly as simple as we'd like to think them as being, and I think uh, deconstruction and post-structuralism and post-modernism introduced a more complex and, in my ways, a more interesting view of the world. Uh, Gil, how about you? Um, what What is your take on Derrida's impact on uh, the idea of speech and these big terms that sometimes obscure uh, things for a lot of uh, lay people? You know, um, I think I, I got kind of stuck uh, in your question at the, um, at the part where Derrida is famous. Um, because I, I, I knew you were uh, interested in popular culture, but it's one of the things that fascinates me. Derrida was very interested in university. Um, that is one of the things on, about which he wrote much more than um, uh, than is, I think, usually acknowledged. And some of his writing on the university has actually taken some time to be translated uh, into English. I mean, it was translated here and there, but not uh, the collections were quite late in coming out. And, and one of the things that is interesting to me is precisely how is Derrida understood in a more popular um, uh, context. Um, now it is true that the word deconstruction is uh, is one of the terms that is associated with him. But as you know, terms like nihilism uh, is also one of the terms. Uh, even Nazism has been associated with uh, with deconstruction. And so um, the question of fame and the question of the uh, effect of ideas that are developed within an intellectual or academic context and the way in which they are uh, repeated, reiterated, and for the most part transformed is actually one of the things which uh, um, uh, uh, Mitchell was just explaining, um, which has to do with the uh, kind of repetition that always introduces transformation. So repetition, as in the repetition of the word deconstruction, is uh, prone it's not certainly the case, but it is prone to introduce some difference. And the difference between the discourse of the university and the discourse at large, the discourse of popular culture, by now is so, um, certainly when it comes to the humanities, or for that matter when it comes to economics and physics, is so enormous that I think that one of the things that, uh, um, that has got to be asked when talking about Derrida is how did this gap this enormous gap happen between the university and, and popular culture. Uh, this is definitely one of the questions that Derrida asked, because one of the things that was um, very much on his mind was the way in which context is said to determine a particular uh, assertion. Um, uh, one of the um, important contributions that he made, and again, this is related to the question of writing and orality, is, uh, is the, the possibility for any um, any mark, actually, not necessarily a, a linguistic mark, uh, a word, a phrase, um, uh, a, a work of art, to function is uh, predicated on its on the possibility that it be ripped from its context. Right? Um, think of what would happen um, if you took uh, any painting and you took off um, the wall of the museum on which it's on which it's hanging. Right? Would that painting still be that painting? 
Uh, what kind of, uh, if you took a painting, you didn't know it was a Van Gogh, would it sell for $143 million? Yeah. Uh, so the way in which a particular idea, a particular sign, a particular word, a particular work of art functions outside of its context is, is one of the things that Derrida would be interested in. And what interests me is your interest in, in that kind of popular figure that Derrida is. Um, and again, the gap between the university, something that I feel every day when I speak with students, yes, uh, the gap between the university and what is called life, right? We live in an ivory tower, uh, whereas real life is outside, um, is constantly puzzling me. Because, of course, if you decide to have a culture where philosophy is not taught to children, right? children are not taught to think philosophically, then obviously when a philosopher is going to become a popular figure, there's going to be some distortion. Mm. And those distortions are very interesting. And they are one of the things that Derrida was, in fact, fascinated by. Uh, Guillaume, I want to follow up with you on something Mitchell actually said since it pertained to religion. And I, I, I want to get into uh, uh, Derrida's uh, uh, views beyond uh, language uh, a little bit later, but uh, I think it's important. Mitchell had said uh, that Derrida basically prioritized uh, the spoken word over the written word. Uh, and so I wanted to ask you, since, since uh, you've studied him in a religious context, uh, what was Derrida's religious belief about God, and was this primacy accorded uh, to the spoken word due to this belief in, say, uh, language as the breath of God, say, uh, if he was religious or if not religious, that makes it even more interesting. Um, um, so actually, what Mitchell said was that Derrida was, uh, um, was um, uh, for, uh, uh, promoting, uh, not promoting, but uh, putting forward uh, uh, the notion that written language is actually, um, is actually primary. That uh, when someone that. speaks, although one appears to um, embrace a kind of immediacy and participate in something that is more immediate, uh, in fact, the structure of the relation that occurs when speaking is um, equally um, uh, predicated on a certain absence. Uh, that's what I was saying earlier about context. Um, if I speak with you right now, if you were not able to record it, whether in your head or in your computer, um, then what I say would not make any sense, right? If it was not possible to, in fact, repeat what I say in some context, right? Repeat technologically, repeat um, by way of a paraphrase later, um, my speech would make no sense. In other words, my speech now, even though it appears immediate, is actually predicated on my absence. It could not function if it did not mean anything outside of my presence. Um, that structure is, of course, the very structure of writing. I write to you because you're not here. And what Derrida is basically saying is that I speak with you because I will no longer be here after you hear me, nor will you be here after I have said what I've said. In other words, our absences are structural to the functioning of language. Um, now, um, I love the phrase religious context. I'm not sure that I actually studied Derrida in a religious context. Uh, um, but one of the questions that Derrida asked was, um, you know, in a somehow expected way, though I'm not sure that formulation is right there, but one could say, well, what is religion? And from your question, one can already assume that religion is belief. Now, whoever said that, um, one of the oldest disputes between Christianity and Judaism is precisely over that, yes? It's who believes and who practices, for example, yes? What do the Jews do as opposed to what the Christians believe? So the very question of belief as the understanding of what religion is, is predicated on a certain understanding of religion, which for a long time has actually made it possible for many traditions that today we call religions to be considered absolutely not religion, right? Buddhism, for example, yes, has been traditionally thought of as a, a, a tradition that doesn't have a relation to God. Whether this is correct is, you know, uh, uh, besides the point. But um, but the absence of God was taken to be a sufficient sign that uh, that Buddhism was not a religion. Islam, in fact, was also considered to not be a religion. It was just considered to be either a heresy or some kind of uh, perversion. Of, uh, of, in fact, human behavior. Uh, to this very day, many people will say Islam is not a legitimate 
religion. So when you ask me what would Derrida's position on religion, um, my first question back would be what is religion and what are we talking about? Well, um, let's uh, then uh, go back to his biography because it seems to me that uh, he's one in a quite a long line, or at least a, an important line of, uh, of French philosophers who are, in a sense, outsiders. Uh, he was a Jew born in Algeria, uh, you know, uh, you know, almost ninety years ago. Um, what what about his background, his family, uh, his, his being born uh, outside of the confines of France? Uh, what effect do you think that had on him as a, a boy growing up uh, that later manifested himself? E either one, if you want to jump in. Well, he was <laughs> he was uh, a French philosopher who lived outside of Paris, actually commuted, drove a car in every day, which uh, uh, distinguishes him from much of the uh, philosophic tradition in, uh, in France, in Paris. Uh, he was he was Jewish. He was an Algerian, which is uh, you know very much on the fringes of Parisian intellectual life. He grew up uh, uh, in a family where uh, two brothers had died, so he grew up very close to death. Uh, and and uh, you know and told me that in some sense all of his work attempt to reconcile himself to death. So, uh, you know, as with much he says, I, yeah, I don't want to hope so much. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, uh, I think he, you know, I, uh, being a journalist, I was allowed to ask a blunt, uh, even stupid questions. So one of my blunt, stupid questions early on in my conversations with him was, uh, was about atheism. I read the history of atheism after the fact. After I, I asked this question, I said, "So we we start with atheism, right?" And uh, boy, was that uh, wrong. <laughs> uh, you mean you mean you were asking him, "Do we are we bo all born atheists?" That sort of thing. No, well, I mean that this that we that we start this uh, philosophic uh, investigation with a, without. Oh, God, okay. without religion in some uh, sort of accepting uh, the, the uh, complication of religion. And, uh, and uh, I'm you, uh, I'm, you know, and I always thought that was sort of like trying to take one brick out of uh, a very complicated edifice and imagining uh, that, that, that you accomplish something. I mean, his view of the world was so much more and his view of culture and his view of philosophy was so much more complicated than, uh, than that, and uh, which I uh, tried to learn and uh, understand. In your talking with him since you actually interviewed him, Mitchell, uh, was he someone who was hesitant to speak of his childhood? Uh, you know, was he someone that uh, you, you talked about, you know, not, his, not wanting to oversimplify? Would it be oversimplifying to try to say, Freudianly analyze, you know, an incident from his youth or, you know, uh, being an Algerian Jew uh, in French society, is, is, would that be an oversimplified way of trying to understand why he thought what he thought? Well, I, I mean, if you, if you limited him to that, I think it would be, but, uh, you know, I, he, he told me all these things. He supplied these uh, details to me. I think... Uh, you know, having been raised uh, by a mother who had lost two sons uh, ar around his mother was, was very important to him. And he said he was, to some extent, uh, death of sense. That he, when he drove up in a car, he imagined, uh, he imagined, uh, and, uh, and, and, and when, you know, in my New York Times article, I, I made a fair amount out of this. And I was afraid that uh, that I might be right and that would embarrass him. Uh, you know, all this talk of personal things and his, uh, you know, what, what he, he basically seemed to be saying was a death obsession. But I guess I misunderstood uh, 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 the French philosopher. He was he, he asked me for a dozen copies of the article, and uh, and uh, this, you know, and he. 
he was he was a serious man, an honest man, and uh, and I, you know, and I was at that, you know, talking about him, a uh, kind and uh, and uh, charming man. Uh, Gil, let me just ask it's you. Very, it's very, yeah, it's very interesting actually because Derrida was, uh, um, as both of you know, he was a a, a, a very um, exigent reader of uh, of Martin Heidegger, the, the German philosopher. And, and one of the things that Heidegger is famous for was when talking about Aristotle, uh, um, he said one could ask about the life of a philosopher, but really the only thing that one needs to know is that he was born, lived, and he died. <clears throat> and Derrida was very much opposed to that. Um, he was very much opposed to that notion that life is something that is kind of outside of work. Um, but what that actually means is that one cannot reduce the work to life, nor can one reduce life to the work. And so that actually entangles things in a very complicated way. Uh, now, about his childhood, for example, one of the things that he inscribed in his writing from very early on is, uh, is the fact that he was, as, as a, a Jewish boy, he was expelled from the French school system at the time when Algeria was uh, colonized by the, by the French and the Vichy laws uh, uh, the anti-Semitic laws were uh, applied in Algeria, and so Derrida was expelled from from uh, from school. And and of course the um, the injury didn't stop there, since uh, Algerian Jews, which had been under colonial regime, granted uh, decreed in fact uh, to be French citizens in 1870, were in 1940 um, uh, basically uh, uh, written off from that. Uh, citizenship. Um, so this is something that is actually written in a way all over his work, and so the impact that it had, uh, his concern with anti-Semitism, his concern with prejudice in uh, in general, or for that matter, with negativity, and indeed with death, uh, is something that is all over his work and all over his life. Um, so to say that it has affected him, I think, is uh, is absolutely correct. It's also true that it is part of his work, I don't know whether it's the cause of his work, but it's part of his work is undeniable. Uh, he would, would have been a pre-teen during World War II in Algeria. One, one second, Mitchell. So uh, was he, uh, was he uh, uh, subject to uh, Vichy, uh, you know, Nazi, uh, you know, uh, Nazi race laws? And was Algeria Vichified? Absolutely. Although the, uh, um, the, 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 the French didn't actually manage to, um, uh, to deport too many Algerian Jews. There were some who were. There were, of course, many who were in the, in, in the metropole. Um, so the, uh, um, the injury was, uh, that he experienced was, uh, was only at that level of expulsion and of being kind of restricted to, to the Jewish community. But he didn't go further as far as his experience uh, went. In fact, he, uh, he spoke very eloquently, uh, that was in 2000 at the conference in Paris, about the fact that his experience of the Holocaust was very, very different from the experience, of course, of European Jews, um, who many of whom, uh, 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 millions of whom, uh, never returned. So he was also very uh, keen on on reminding people that his experience of the Holocaust was not quite the same as as those who experienced the full brunt of the Nazi regime. Um, uh, Mitchell, yeah, so. Mitchell, you you had a point. I'm sorry. Yeah, when I was, you know, we should note that when I was writing about him at the end of the 20th century, uh, new discoveries were being made about the extent of Martin Heidegger's. Uh, uh, entanglement with Nazism in Germany. I mean, he became provost of uh, his university uh, while Hitler was power and a, a fairly shameful uh, development. And and also, uh, uh, probably uh, Derrida's outstanding follower, again, to use these journalistic terms, uh, in the United States was Paul the Man. And, uh, and uh, we learn also more or less this time, uh, that he had written for an anti-Semitic publication in Belgium, where he was from. And I was asked to add, add at the last minute one paragraph to my New York Times profile of Derrida, and they insisted that I say something of uh, the man's uh, involvement with uh, an anti-Semitic publication.
station in uh, in Belgium, uh, and, and to which I, I noted uh, Derrida's own personal experience, and this happened well before obviously anything to do with uh, uh, with, uh, with the development of uh, deconstruction and and his philosophic work. Although it was significant in the event of, in, in the life of this and the thinking of this Yale professor, I don't deny. So this became a big issue, and uh, and because uh, these kinds of philosophers, as, as I think it's, you know, it is becoming apparent as we talk about them, and this kind of philosophy is very complicated. Uh, it, it bothers people. It uh, it seems to make complicated things that people don't want to be complicated and and they want to attack it but because it's complicated it's not simple to attack so this these biographical facts about a, uh, a philosopher Derrida was very interested in and a literary theorist who was very influenced by uh, Derrida were a way for his critics to uh, attack absurdly I believe uh, uh, Derrida's work and, and the work of people who were, were interested in his work well, let me talk about uh, Derrida's education uh, from boyhood through college and uh, um, where where the genesis of some of his views on language came from. I know that he had he read a lot of uh, modernist writing uh, of the twentieth century. Um, let's let's talk about the the young intellectual uh, Derrida. Uh, what things influenced him, and, and why do you think? Let me uh, start with you, Gil. Um, uh, if if you want to just take a stab at it. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure. I, uh, um, I mean, there are a lot of ways of answering, um, um, you know, people that he read when he was young, uh, the fact that he went through, in fact, uh, a French education in the most kind of, uh, um, recognizable way. Um, uh, he, after all, uh, arrived to France when he was, uh, uh, basically 19, um, and, and started, uh, on a, on a course that was actually quite arduous. Uh, it was it was a student who was uh, both obviously extremely intelligent, but also um, having many difficulties with exams, with the pressure, uh, with the fact that he was in a um, unfamiliar milieu, even though he had been educated again within the French system in Algeria, again colonized Algeria. Um, but um, but I'm not sure. Um, it's something that that you know related to popularity. Uh, as I said earlier, Derrida was thinking about the way with a particular sign, a particular mark, a particular work of art, but in many ways a particular individual uh, is um, uh, kind of functioning within and without the context, right? The, 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 the disappearance of context, but also the renewal of context, the fact that one um, appears, right? Again, a painting that is on a museum wall is not the same as a painting that is in a vault. It doesn't function in the same way. In one case, it's a it's a, a valuable commodity. In another case, it's uh, something to be admired. Right? Simplifying a little bit. Um, so um, the way in which the philosopher uh, functions in a in a larger context is not something I think uh, that can actually be narrated as a life. I understand, of course, the question: What can we say about his life, about his early childhood? It's a very uh, again, it's something that he himself was concerned with, but I don't know that this would be the place to start. Um, um, who he read um, and who he started writing about, uh, and again, Heidegger, Emmanuel Levinas, uh, 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 philosopher uh, Edmond Husserl, the, uh, the phenomenologist, right, the founder of modern phenomenology. I think, um, I don't think there's a point in Derrida's writing, in Derrida's career, where the reference to Husserl is not actually. Uh, either explicit or just under the surface. So he was very much a philosopher. He was interested in both philosophical and non-philosophical objects, uh, literary objects, for example. Like the, the literary within the philosophical was obviously one of his uh, questions. And you could say, well, that's because he read a, a lot of literature. But I think it's also because the separation between philosophy and literature, which has historical roots, um, kind of like the right, writing and orality distinction, is something that he wanted to uh, um, uh, reflect on, and that he actually saw signs of, um, as Mitchell was saying earlier, even Plato was certainly um, superiority of writing, of humanity, 
will nonetheless uh, define morality as the writing on the heart. Uh, so this kind of uh, failure of the philosophical to remain true to its own um, principle, as it were, uh, is part of what we're talking about. So I think there's a kind of failure of the biographical um, in, in, in trying to understand Derrida that seems to me important to register, that it's not so um, obvious that the way to understand someone is by way of their biography, rather than by, by way of, for example, their uh, national trajectory or transnational trajectory, by way of their social class, by way of their race, or by way of a particular period, like the Cold War, say, uh, uh, in terms of the functioning of the philosophy. Uh, Mitchell, let me ask you about uh, the influences of the young, uh, uh, the young man. Uh, I, I know that he had uh, uh, spoken of some of the modernists like uh, James Joyce. Uh, he mentioned uh, uh, Husserl. Uh, when you spoke with him, did he have a particular fondness for certain writers or certain artists or certain thinkers uh, at the time when you spoke to him, when reflecting back on his youth? His interests were remarkably and wonderfully broad. Uh, well, I watched him teach a seminar at my university, NYU, on the subject of secrets, something that obsessed him and fascinated him for quite a while. And, uh, and they were reading, the primary text was uh, uh, a piece by Edgar Allan Poe. Is that right? And yeah, and, uh, oh no, Herman Melville, I'm sorry. Herman Melville. Oh, right. Bartleby. Bartleby is the one you mentioned. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, with, with the wonderful line, I prefer not to, uh, that part of Bartleby's line, and, uh, which I, I hear all over the place still. And uh, so his interests were, were amazingly broad. You know, as she just said, he, uh, you know, like when he was studying text, that also included paintings that, uh, that you know, that, that was not limited in any way. That included the Declaration of Independence, which he uh, was fascinated by in, in some ways. His interests were remarkably much broad, and he was a very literary man. Let me make, though, uh, another kind of journalistic point, which is uh, there's probably a reason that this philosopher is being discussed here by two people who are not quite philosophers, or in my case, not at all philosophers. Uh, because he is uh, not much talk in philosophy departments in the United States, in the United Kingdom uh, today. Uh, he was very much in law with a number of philosophers, Husserl and Heidegger, but you know, but Nietzsche and Kant and all these people he was talking with. And uh, but the Anglo-American philosophy, philosophy today is uh, is less in dialogue. These people, as I understand it, and uh, and 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 less interested in him, more interested in logic and, and a different kind of analysis of language, and and occasionally and shamefully, I believe, uh, just dis dismissive of uh, some of his work, or has been dismissive of some of his work. Well, uh, I want to end this first segment on, on his biography, basically, and then in the next segment talk about uh, some of the ideas, uh, pro, con, those that were seminal, those that are uh, most associated with him. But there's one thing I wanted to touch on before we end this segment, and there's a famous uh, quote by Derrida, and I, I, I would butcher it if I tried to pronounce it in French, but it's been translated either as uh, being, there is nothing outside of the text, or there is, uh, there, is no, there is no such thing as out of context. And since, uh, Mitchell, you uh, are a reporter, I'll start with you and then uh, end with Gil. Um, that, that's a, a statement that, that has been mistranslated, as, as I said. Uh, did he ever explain what he meant by that specifically and about the misperceptions about that uh, French, which I'm not going to try to quote? already, you know, particularly uh, from my colleague here, uh, it, you know, you can't just, you can't just talk about the work, you can't just talk about the biography, you can't just talk about the historical period, you can't just talk about what's going on in the culture, you can't just talk about the painting, you have to talk about 
the wall, it's hung on. Uh, context, context, context is in some sense everything, but it's not, but, but that doesn't mean the work isn't something. Uh, so it's not everything, but context is a lot, and context is in some sense endless. Uh, which gives us lots to talk about. Well, that that's sort of like modern identity art, where where you basically get art as a bumper sticker. I am fill in the blank. But for example, uh, I was just looking uh, over something online. And he was a big fan of Chaplin. If I wrote a novel about Charlie Chaplin and I give no biographical details, the very fact I was interested enough to write a novel about Charlie Chaplin says a lot about me biographically. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, he'll... it does, but it also, but it also speaks to the fact that Chaplin is one of the most famous figures of the 20th century. In other words, um, um, your interest is not simply self-generated, right? It comes from a place where, um, in fact, at this point, to decide to write a biography of Chaplin is kind of to respond to the extraordinary interest that his uh, sheer image, right, the the, the Trump, for, uh, um, um, is continuing to generate. It's one of the most recognizable icons. It's like Einstein's face, yes? Um, and so um, so I do think that there's, um, um, we want to be careful about how much we in fact attribute to the individual uh, uh, as a kind of point of origin. And I think that that might be uh, one way of understanding this, there is nothing outside the text, which is a kind of mangled translation, but we don't need to get uh, into that. The point is that there's a certain, uh, if not continuity, uh, um, too many entangled relations between the text and that which is outside of it to simply say this is where this ends and this is where this begins. So just as you say, well, if I'm writing a biography of Chaplin, it says a lot about me. You're absolutely right. But it says more or at least as much about the culture within which you live where Chaplin is this recognizable figure. It certainly says a lot about whether your biography will sell. Yes, because if you were to write a biography about someone who is absolutely not remembered, you you know uh, uh, you're making a wager, and uh, uh, and that would be a very different kind of endeavor to uh, uh, to engage in. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think in this twenty first century day and age, uh, it says a lot that probably most people under twenty five won't even know who Charlie Chaplin is these days. But that's another show. Uh -huh. Um, uh, let's uh, end this first segment, and in the uh, next segment, let's talk about uh, some of the more seminal ideas and works of Derrida, and we'll do that in a moment. Talking about Jacques Derrida, I have Mitchell Stevens, and I have Gil Anajad. Uh, let us talk about uh, uh, Derrida's uh, uh, evolution as a thinker from his uh, youth uh, through his death. Um, what was, and I'll start with you, Gil, first, and then go to Mitchell. Uh, what was uh, the first uh, work that he wrote, say, that made a public impact of, uh, either in Europe or worldwide, and, 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 and why? Hmm. You know, you got me there. I actually don't remember what, uh, uh, I certainly don't remember what the first thing uh, is. Um, uh, certainly, in the American context, uh, the, the, uh, the, there's two major moments, which is a 1966 conference at Johns Hopkins, where Derrida and Lacan and Roland Barthes and, and, and a slew of other French intellectuals uh, uh, are invited for, uh, for this major conference where the impact, uh, uh, many people date the moment, the post-structural moment uh, to that particular conference. Um, I think uh, in France, the year 1967 is probably uh, uh, key because three of Derrida's uh, major books are published in that year, although Derrida is already very well known from the series of articles and from books that he has already written on Rousseau, uh, uh, articles that he's written on Emmanuel Levinas, uh, on Foucault. So he's already, uh, on the French scene, he's very, uh, uh, very known starting in the early 60s. Uh, in America, it starts later, obviously, the publication in 1976, if I'm not mistaken, of uh, Grammatology in the translation of Gayatri Spivak is uh, uh, a kind of watershed, um, which, uh, which definitely establishes, as a, as a major, establishes him as a major figure. And the question, both of writing and orality, uh, and I think, as Mitchell was saying earlier, I think the, the question of death as a kind of structural problem as a constant problem 
uh, it is very much there throughout. Um, as, as is the question of, of the relationship between orality and writing, as is the question of the relationship between philosophy and literature. Uh, those accompany him uh, throughout. There's, um, there's no, um, I, I would almost want to say at that level that there's no evolution in, uh, and I think he would very much agree with that, there's no evolution in his work. The questions uh, are very much there and they inscribe and they keep being uh, kind of, um, you know, rephrased, recontextualized, if you will, uh, re explored. Uh, throughout, uh, throughout his work. So if, if you say that there's no evolution, would it be fair to say that he just sort of parallaxed his ideas over the decades? Uh, and if so, what was at the bedrock core of his belief systems, whether it's about the human condition in general or more specifically about the way humans uh, communicate? Uh, let me, let me, I'll, I'll go to Mitchell in a moment, but let me just get uh, Gil's idea here. A human. Uh, you know, he, I don't think he used that term very much. Uh, uh, if anything, uh, and again, not to simplify, um, I'm not sure that the human was necessarily at the, uh, at the center of his preoccupations. I mean, he wrote a famous text that was called The Ends of Man, um, where, um, um, where the question, in fact, of, of, of um, you could put it again in terms of the question of, of the mark, yes, of that which functions within a particular um, uh, frame, right, the question of framing. So is the human at the center of the frame? I think it would be very difficult to answer yes, um, um, that the human is always implicated in the questions that Derrida raised. I mean, clearly death, um, but um, but one of the things that, um, that he was very concerned with uh, and that became... Uh, much more explicit. Um, so you could say that there's a work of explicitation that is uh, ongoing in his writing, is of course the way in which death is uh, something that gets articulated as a major difference between the human and the animal, right? That the animal just uh, die, the way uh, Heidegger would uh, put it, that the animal just uh, kind of collapses, um, uh, whereas the um, whereas to the human uh, is conscious of its death um, is something that Derrida was very much going after. In fact, that uh, uh, any attempt to to um, to have any kind of principle, any particular element, to be a defining element, uh, a principle, a bedrock, as you said, upon which anything would be founded. Uh, so, a term that is used in the American university is, of course, anti-foundationalist. Um, and though Derrida would not embrace the term, um, it, it may have a heuristic function in reminding us that um, um, nothing that would be said to be proper to man, um, not even the human, is something that Derrida would necessarily place at the center and certainly not at the foundation of, uh, of his thinking. Remember, if there is nothing outside the text, if, uh, if the distinction between the text and the context is not something that is granted, then the distinction between the human and the non-human, which is, again, throughout his work inscribed, beginning with writing, uh, right, writing is death. Writing is technology, whereas speech is living and and, and immediate. <coughs> is one of the first distinctions that Derrida was interested in in interrogating. And so, um, I don't think I would put the human. On the other hand, certainly there is. Uh, I suppose for those of us who might want to say for us humans, uh, there's definitely uh, something to reflect on when reading Derrida. Um, for example, the distinction that we might make between the human and the environment, a distinction that continues to uh, apply, even though clearly the environment is about to take over and, um, you know, possibly get rid of us humans. So I think the way in which we maintain those distinctions is something that we, uh, um, we need to worry about, and that was very um, keen on making us worry about a lot of things. Uh, Mitchell, let me uh, turn to you and ask you a two-part question. Um, uh, Gill sort of implied that he thought that uh, there was no evolution uh, in Derrida's thought. Uh, would you agree with that? Do you think that he was merely parallaxing his, his sort of bedrock core beliefs? And secondly, what when you interviewed him, what work do you think that he thought of his own was the most uh, important or influential? So let me just start with the first about uh, was there a core to him that he just merely embroidered upon over the decades, or do you think that he evolved? Did he think he evolved? 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And, and, and you know, and, and I, I support what Jill said that, uh, that, you know, he kept doing what he was doing. Uh, his project, you know, I think from the moment he burst on the scene in 1966 in the United States uh, was, was his project. And, you know, the wonderful thing about it is he, he applied his interrogations, which is a wonderful word uh, for what he did, to many different subject matters, to a wide-ranging group of subject matters. But if there was an evolution, I would say it had to do I mean, initially, I think he was proving the point. He was uh, he was proving the method initially, and I think that you know the emphasis. You know, again, I haven't read everything he's written. I, I won't pretend to have, uh, but I, I I think he was establishing the method to some extent early on, and in his later decades, I think he was just more freely. Uh, Enjoying the fruits of the method, or enjoying some of the some of the additional subject matters it could be applied to, and maybe I should take a, a shot at uh, at what that method is, or, or expand on this notion of distinctions. Uh, I mean, you know, the obvious word, and the word that you know I heard a lot from uh, the people I interviewed who uh, who have, have studied his work is hierarchy. We tend to establish these uh, hierarchies in life. You know, for so much of human history, male, female was the hierarchy. Uh, colonial power and, uh, and and people living in the colonies, that was a, a, a hierarchy. They're all, I mean, this is a very political. Uh, uh, human animal is a hierarchy we've established and we insist on. And, you know, and it's easy to think that there's some clear black line, black-white is obviously a hierarchy, some clear line uh, between different things. And, uh, you know, I first understood, and, and another one is speech, which is pure and true, and somehow connected to our souls, and right, which is this artificial thing, or, you know, the historian of communication, uh, you know, that... Uh, that, and then writing is more real than television, and television is more real than the internet. We tend to we tend to make these these distinctions, and he's he's very much in the business of determining them, of questioning them, of interrogating them, of saying uh, yeah, but, and uh, and he does it with as much intelligence as uh, I, I, I've seen anyone else do. So, uh, you know, to the extent that this is his method and one hesitates so, so much here to oversimplify, I think he established it a bit at the beginning and then he applied it. I mean, thinking about secrets, for example, the whole notion that a secret doesn't work without the possibility of revealing the secret. So a secret has within it the possibility of being revealed. That's a sort of fascinating overturning or complication that it seems to me he was doing. Well, well if, I may, if I may pick up uh, uh, on that, because uh, uh, definitely the word hierarchy is, uh, uh, is there. One of the words for which Derrida is famous for, uh, which has all kinds of ironies associated with it, because in English it ended up being pronounced differently when uh, part of the point that Derrida was making in French was in fact to introduce it. A, a difference in the spelling of the word difference, which in fact could not be heard, um, making the point that you could introduce letter A instead of the letter E in the word difference in French, différence, um, um, that would not be heard and yet would have in fact uh, um, an impact on the way in which the word is understood. On the, on the way in which it functions, on the way in which difference functions. So it's always funny to me that one of his key words uh, uh, is a word for which the uh, un unhearable difference became precisely that which is heard, so that people in English say difference, 
um, uh, rather than difference, which is the way in which the word should be pronounced in order to make the point. But anyway, these are some of the ironies of translation. But different, difference, the philosophers of difference, of which Derrida was presumably a member of a cohort, difference is very much something that is at the center of, uh, of thinking. And people have actually tried to argue that there's, for example, a major kind of ethical turn or political turn in Derrida's career. Um, but to pick up on another example, I very much like uh, um, the secret uh, uh, illustration that Mitchell just gave. Um, but another moment uh, that I think is, uh, uh, is kind of uh, uh, illustrative, when Derrida speaks about forgiveness, um, um, he, he was very interested in conditions of possibility and conditions of impossibility of anything um, actually being the case. Um, and when he spoke about forgiveness, he gave just this beautiful way of, uh, 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 of phrasing it, which is that if you do something to me that is eminently forgivable, right? if you push me uh, um, without intent um, and you say forgive me, I will answer there's nothing to forgive. It's eminently forgivable, right? And the last point was, if something is forgivable, there is nothing to forgive. It's only if something is unforgivable that forgiveness is called for, which is why forgiveness is impossible, because it can only answer to the impossible, to that which is unforgivable. Um, and I think this is one of the interesting ways in which he, um, he was making all of our lives difficult. Uh, um, uh, in, in reminding us uh, of the difficulties of that which we take for granted, yes? And of course, the moment you say it, it's one of like those, you know, uh, matchbox puzzles when you just move one match and you recognize that there's no problem, except of course, in this case, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, namely, that we forgive each other all the time, or maybe none of the time, uh, uh, and don't take into account the impossibility that is at the center of the matter. It's interesting that you mentioned that, Gil, because yesterday I was watching Wild Strawberries by uh, Ingmar Bergman last night, and there's a passage where uh, the old man and his daughter-in-law are talking just about almost exactly what you were talking about, forgiveness there, and that actually predates uh, uh, Derrida by about a decade or so. Um, since you both said that you're uh, not philosophers, I don't want to get bogged down then too much in the text. I want to sort of bring uh, Derrida out into a larger context. And before I, I talk about a couple of things, uh, such as politics and uh, uh, literature and his influence there, uh, I did a show recently uh, with a couple of experts on Marshall McLuhan. Uh, and like Derrida, since you mentioned uh, that he's out of favor with American academia, uh, uh, McLuhan, I guess, has never been <laughs> at any point uh, in favor. But it seems to me that there are some interesting, uh, I don't know if I'd call them convergences, but uh, parallelisms between the the two appro the approaches of both men to the way uh, ideas are communicated. Um, uh, let me start with uh, you, Mitchell, and then go to Gil. Uh, by any chance, did Derrida ever mention McLuhan and his ideas about, you know, the medias, the message, and, 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 and these kinds of things? Was he aware of McLuhan, and uh, what did he think of him, if anything? Uh, I never discuss McLuhan, uh, but it, you know, but it's interesting. I think you're onto something. I do think that you know part of what McLuhan was doing was saying that the way we communicate has profound effects on on the communication, and these, you know, and these were these were questions at least that Derrida was very alert to. In some ways, he's you know, he's complicating, he's, you know, all these things that McLuhan is, might be saying. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, maybe, maybe he did, did he, did he write something on McLuhan? Or something that would affect... Uh, you know, I, I, I have, um, I, I mean, I would, uh, it would take more time for me to check. I think McLuhan is mentioned. He might even be mentioned somewhere in Dramatology. I'm not sure, but um, but discussed um, in any kind of extended way, I don't think so. That there are interesting, uh, an interesting conversation that could be and should be set up between Macron and uh, and Derrida. I don't think is in doubt. I think that the, the question of um, of the media is very much uh, there, right? Writing that to recognize that orality is a medium um, and not and not in fact the absence of media. 
uh, is something that everyone was very much um, uh, insisting upon, uh, and, and if we're paying attention to different kinds of mediations, um, whether whether we know that agreed with the kind of dramatic distinctions that Macron was making between the different kind of media, um, you know, this is a, a, a different question. But that there are parallels to the to, um, to the question that uh, um, you were asking before, like to what extent we actually understand those kind of philosophical uh, texts and, 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 and movements uh, in terms of a particular individual. And, and surely there are uh, very important distinctions to make between the texts. Uh, uh, obviously, understanding media is a very different text than, um, uh, than of grammatology. But, um, but what would it mean to read them together and to actually ask, well, if there is no whole text, and if there is no outside the text, where does one begin and the other end, and what would it mean to read them together? I should say that um, saying that I'm not a philosopher uh, um, is doesn't mean staying away from the text, actually. Uh, in the encounters that I was um, 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 fortunate to witness between Derrida and philosophers, it was always fascinating to me to see how uh, non-readers philosophers often are. They're not really interested in reading. The moment you you start quibbling over you know a particular sentence or a particular use of a word, philosophers start getting a little nervous. Whereas Derrida was you know completely um, uh, invested, in fact, in the way in which texts function, in the way in which they don't function. So um, you know I hesitated to, to to describe myself as a reader, and it's precisely because Derrida, the man, were very much kind of uh, hyper readers. And, and, and demanding of a kind of discipline and attentiveness to text that was, I think, very different from what philosophers usually uh, uh, demand. Yeah. Um, so not being a philosopher doesn't mean stay away from the text, actually. It means plunging in it um, uh, much more. But, but again, I understand the question. Okay, well, uh, let, let me turn to uh, uh, Derrida and his influence uh, first on literature uh, going forward from his time and then uh, more generally uh, and pop culturally to politics, uh, which unfortunately I think has infected a lot of other disciplines it should stay the hell out of. But uh, um, let me talk about the literature. We, we live in a time now in the early 21st century as we're recording it where uh, we basically seemingly have books, at least here in America, and I, I can't speak for Europe, but certainly not Asia or the rest of the world uh, as well, where we seem to have either childish uh, books that become popular, whether it's the Harry Potters or the vampire books that are proliferate, or we have these obscurantist pseudo-intellectual works from people like a Pinchon or a David Foster Wallace or lesser iterations of them, where uh, a reader is almost seemingly scorned upon or we'll have somewhere in the middle this squishy kind of romance novel attempts uh, at uh, you know uh, a historical figure or whatnot, uh, and oftentimes this is traced back to postmodernism, poststructuralism. That uh, you know someone like uh, it was mentioned earlier, Melville, if uh, Moby Dick were written today, assumingly updated for the twenty first century, that it could not be published because. Uh, it would be too classical in its approach to things, that uh, it, it wouldn't be hip and ironic and all of these things that are associated with uh, these big isms. Uh, let me start with you, Mitchell, uh, uh, since uh, you have uh, uh, written about him. Uh, did he, did he, what, what was uh, Derrida's uh, thoughts about Say a lot of these uh, writers that I've mentioned, uh, the, uh, the the postmodernists. Did he think that they were breaking things down to a, a point of silliness, the uh, uh, bumper stickers, and we've got identity art now? What do you think his idea about his influence in what has become now, uh, literarily or artistically, in the world is? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I don't, you know. First of all, we should acknowledge that Derrida was a writer and very much saw himself as a writer and quite an experimental writer in his uh, in his own, in his own right uh, and uh, you know one of his books is uh, half a footnote and uh, I mean he loved playing with these things he loved challenging the structure of sentences the structure of pages uh, 
and, and so on. And so he was, you know, so if you don't like uh, experimental fiction, you're not going to like uh, Jacques Derrida's experimental philosophy writing, if that's what he's doing. And, uh, you know, I, I think he was, he was on the side of experimentation. But I would, you know, I think there's something much larger going on in the culture that he was part of, that he fed into, and so on. And that is kind of wonderful, not disturbing, uh, but also disturbing. Which is, you know, I, you know, I think what we make clear that Derrida challenged a lot of simplicity, a lot of hierarchies, a lot of differences, a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of ways of uh, fairly simple ways of seeing the world, or seeing conversations, seeing writings, seeing authors, and uh, and I think we live in a world where these simplicities are being surrendered in various ways. There's very much uh, an ongoing backlash to this. Is, uh, we see in the disaster of American politics lately. Uh, but it, it is, I think, a reaction to something. You know, it's a reaction to when I ask my undergraduates uh, if they can, uh, or how they would tell a roommate that they're, they just met somebody that, uh, that they're really attracted to, that the answer often is, I think I'm in love. It's not, I think I'm in love. So I think I'm in love because they know something about love. Sadly, not sadly, they know something about love. They know, they, they don't walk into it with blindly, with some narrow focus. And I think this is all over. If I think it's all over in literature, and, you know, it's even in American film in various ways. And I think it should, be. and uh, and I, you know, and I, you know, for me, looking as a journalist, trying to sort of untangle some of the threads in uh, in more recent intellectual history, uh, untangling being a questionable activity too, in the in the context of our conversation, uh, I, I think this has a lot to do with uh, Derrida's place. In the culture, I think he contributed to making, making you know, to the extent that his ideas have filtered down through uh, you know to professors like us and into students and so on, uh, and in writers and, and, and so on, uh, and filmmakers. I think he contributed to this idea, and I also think he's helping us understand this postmodern world. Uh, Agil, what are your ideas? It, 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 your, your question is interesting because uh, um, I, if I if I understand the gist of it, um, there's a sense that something has been kind of degenerating in terms of uh, of culture. I think it's important in this context to actually remember that Melville died completely impoverished, and that Moby Dick was a total bust, for which you know the reception was that, you know, you shouldn't even pick it up. Uh, um, uh, Moby Dick became a bestseller way, way later than Melville uh, died in the 1920s. Um, so, um, so I think, um, I think personally, I might be a little more of a devolutionist than that Derrida, but Derrida would actually uh, 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 ask whether the transformations that we are witnessing are, you know, going up or going down. And it's interesting to me because I, 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 if I understood correctly, you're a bit of a fan of Steven Pinker, who is telling us that we live in a much better world than we ever did because there's much less violence. And on the other hand, as you seem to be suggesting, we also appear to be living in a world where culture is uh, devalued and where, uh, you know, Fifty Shades of Grey is a world bestseller, whereas, uh, uh, whereas whatever uh, other, um, you know, uh, major poet is completely unknown, even as you were suggesting, Charlie Chaplin is not even known. So, uh, um, so I do think that there are complicated uh, uh, issues to uh, to think about. I, I also think that Derrida would ask us to actually think, for example, about that particular connection. Like, if we will, if we live in a world that is less violent, how, what is the, the the violence, as it were, of a culture that can lose itself in in sometimes 
the most mind-numbing, uh, um, you know, prose, um, a la Dan Brown or a la Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, well, we, uh, or Twilight, we're not talking about, um, I suppose some of us might want to have arguments over the quality of the prose of G.K. Rowling, but, uh, uh, but I don't think there's really much of an argument over, uh, over Fifty Shades, yes? Like, we're not talking about major literature. Um, I have a friend, uh, a friend, not a friend, an acquaintance who actually said to me at, uh, at some point that literature is a little like wine. Sometimes you do want the expensive and we find wine, and sometimes you just want a bottle of cheap wine. And that literature should actually be, be thought of in those uh, uh, different ways. What do you feel like today? Um, Again, it's the question of difference, I think, that Derrida would ask us to think about. Where, where is, in fact, the culture uh, not only going, but what is it actually achieving um, some kind of um, value? Um, mm. Or what kind of values is it conveying or reflecting or, uh, for that matter, mirroring? Um, it's true, you know, uh, um, for example, um, if competency as a writer is something that one would think is necessary, one would also think that it's necessary to become president of the country, and apparently that is no longer the case. So, um, so it's difficult to actually adjudicate on the value of literature at a time when the value of anything seems to be interrogated by the major institutions uh, that surround us. Um, um, so it's the differences between both the past and the present um, but I think it's important to remember again that Melville was a bust. Like he, when he wrote like kind of light novels about ocean traveling, uh, he was a bestseller. And the moment he wrote Moby Dick, everybody went like. Well, the thing know, to say that. though is, is Mel Melville was a bust pop culturally, financially. That's a different axis by which to measure. I mean, Moby Dick, if it was just being published today and had sat around for 160 years. It's still a great work of art. It has it has markers, and that that's I think for me the point as, as an artist is uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. Okay, J.K. Rowling. No one considers that art, but someone will consider Pinchon art or or, or uh, Dave Eggers art when they clearly are for me sub J.K. Rowling in terms of their ability to communicate. At least at least we can get a story, whether it's original or interesting, about Harry Potter. At least there's there's a story there, and it's 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 not as marked with cliches. And one of the things I wanted to just talk before we get to politics, because it's a sort of a segue, is I wonder what identity art. What what do you think either of you think that uh, Derrida would think of identity art? Because uh, you, people who have watched my channel can see know that I'm sort of uh, balding in the middle, but not fully bald. And Mitchell is bald, and you have a full head of hair. But if we were to identify ourselves by our hairiness, that seems to me the most least inter or the least interesting part of us. That that uh, Gil has a, a full head of hair, that Mitchell is bald, and that I'm somewhere in between seems to say the least about us possible, uh, rather than. You know, if if Gil, uh, if if Mitchell were to write a, a book about his travels, uh, I don't know, to the Soviet Union, if he had done that, or, or to to Bolivia or whatnot, that says to me far more about him himself than that he uh, looks like uh, what is the the not the Ajax man, uh, Mister Clean. <laughs> you know, uh, that and so what? Let me let me start with you, Gil. What what do you think? Uh, I'm not sure I want to pick up on that. But, okay, uh, but let me, let me just ask you, what, what do you think Derrida would think of modern identity art, which to me is the least interesting part of a human being? You know, I'm not sure that I actually uh, uh, know the reference. Uh, me or my hair as the <laughs> reference. Uh, um, Either or uh, both, I guess. <laughs> um, I don't think... Um, I don't think it's possible to completely extricate, and particularly in this day and age, to extricate ourselves from the fact that I has, appears to be the most important letter of the alphabet. Uh, whether we are talking about technology or cars, uh, um, or, or for that matter, individuals, or even websites, right? Uh, um, or I, me, myself, uh, appear to be um, uh, massive signifiers. Um, that um, that structure the way in which we think about ourselves, and you know, uh, uh, even your line of questioning over Derrida's life and biography suggests, in fact, that there's a way of understanding. It may not be the hair, but like which school did he go to? And you know, uh, obviously these are at different levels, but um, but I think that um, you know, judging by 
the reaction of some children to my hairiness. Um, I think that in some cases it might be um, it might be in fact a very different kind of uh, um, signifier. Um, I, I remember reading a few years ago um, something in the Village Voice about the fact that uh, beards um, have an amazing history in the United States. Um, uh, uh, there's a uh, this wonderful book whose title I'm going to forget right now, but about hairiness and the way in which we relate to different parts of our bodies as being hairy or not hairy. Uh, and in fact, it gets to be much, much more complicated. And it's been interesting to see that um, uh, after 9-11, beards were even more kind of vilified. Like if you had a beard, you must be either homeless or you want to be profit or, or, or some kind of practice. And, to, and, and, and or, or worse, a lot, a Muslim. Um, so it's interesting today that you know the hipsters uh, uh, are bringing the beard and the full beard uh, back. I think that um, again, I would be more concerned. And I think that I would ask us to to think about the way in which certain distinctions are being made as to what is important. I appreciate what you said about Melville wrote a work of art, but at the time, no one appeared to know that. Yes, yeah. and I think that it matters, um, which also suggests that it may or may not be a work of art. Always, um, uh, the very definition of the work of art is after all um, changing. One could say that it's contextual. Um, the value that is accorded to the to, to the to the thing is is not something that is established for all eternity. And um, all I was saying by pointing that that Melville died in poverty and that Moby Dick was received, in fact, as a very uh, as a failure, as an aesthetic failure. Um, is that uh, obviously values change, um, and that that which we consider today uh, a work of art or not, or for that matter, literature, um, is um, is something that needs to be looked at in terms of what else we are valuing, right? Again, Van Gogh goes for one hundred fifty-three million dollar. J.K. Rowling is a is a billionaire, um, and yet um, there would be some significant difference between the two, and I. I don't know. Um, uh, obviously, a part of me that was raised on ideals that I think are similar to yours wants to think that that's the case. I think Derrida would basically say, let's just look at the way in which those distinctions are produced. Um, what is valued, what is not valued, what kind of hierarchy, as Mitchell was saying, is established, and for what purpose and in what circles. Mitchell, uh, did he ever mention identity art to you? Uh, no, but, but let's understand. Let's under and, and, you know, I was writing about him uh, some decades ago. Uh, and, and you know, and he was, as I am to some extent, a product of the 60s. And he was very much, uh, he was very much a man of the left. And, uh, and he, you know, he lived in a time when, uh, uh, when establishing uh, the rights of women in, Politics in the home and in universities very much was really important, and I think he was uh, he was involved in in that struggle in his way. And and the hierarchy, male female, is one that he questioned and challenged and wanted in various ways to uh, overturn. Uh, and and obviously he lived in a time when, uh, as we continue to, where uh, people of color uh, uh, were. Uh, uh, we're, we're suffering and we're discriminated against in various ways, and this was very important to him. So, he, you know, the fact that some of these movements seem to have poten potentially gotten, uh, I don't want to say out of control, I mean, some of them were so important, and uh, uh, how would he have reacted to that? You know, he, he was not a person who saw the world in simple terms, as, as you know, I think we. Uh, Jill's just made abundantly clear, uh, and you know, and so I think he would have been alert to these considerations. But yeah, you know, he, he, you know, he, 1968 in Paris was very important to him. He was, you know, he was involved in all these things, and uh, and uh, and, he, and he was challenging. You know, he was a rebel in some ways. I mean, these things that sound, uh, you know, these disputes that sound fairly academic were not academic to him. They were a challenge 
of a kind of established author. And one of the things that I found fascinating by him, and let's talk about his hair a little bit, uh, he had a luxuriant uh, growth of, uh, of uh, silver hair on top of his head, and he usually was the best dressed man in, uh, in most of the rooms he was in. Also, in many cases, the oldest man, but you know, the, he was quite a sharp dresser and an attractive man. And, uh, uh, and yet, for a significant part of his life, told me he refused to be photographed. He uh, kind of rejected that attempt to restrict him to his looks, to you know, to an image. And uh, later, being Derrida, and uh, 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 he concluded, as he put it, that he had been attached to the image of the non-image. So he he flipped that a little bit. And uh, I wrote about it, he did have photographs of him in them. Uh, and when I think, you know, so he was a rebel, but he was, who is somebody who could question and could, uh, uh, could look in another context in another way. So, I, you know, he would have, I think it would have been uh, really interesting in uh, in this political moment in uh, in many ways. You used the term Mitchell, man of the left, and post World War II, the European man of the left was a term that certainly in European arts, European cinema was bandied about. And you know, you, we think of the Fellinis and the Bergmans and uh, the Antonionis, those uh, types of people. Um, in America, uh, I know Derrida was uh, not only considered. Uh, uh, I guess, anathema in terms of just ideas related to literature, but certainly the the resurgent right during the 70s uh, and 80s, uh, Reaganism, he was sort of outre here. Uh, was he also sort of reviled or, or demonized by right-wing elements in Europe as well? Uh, let me start with you, Mitch, and then uh, we'll go to Gil. Yeah, I don't really, I don't really know that history, but it's, it, 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 there were... Uh, a few books attacking him for deconstruction or what was going on on the campuses and so on uh, public at the end of the 20th century and selling the last more copies probably than Derrida's books did. And, uh, and there was a fairly hysterical attack from, from the right and there were attacks from the left too from, uh, you know, from people in, the, in philosophy departments, I should call them more traditional but People in uh, who were more interested in the logic or language or language oriented in a somewhat different way, uh, philosophy, were, were quite upset. The sense by people who had not penetrated deeply into this work, people who were on the left, that there was a kind of obfuscation going on, and then this overturning of hierarchies, uh, a kind of uh, ability to uh, make political distinctions was being lost, and he uh, he was constantly uh, uh, ha having to deal with uh, well, not constantly, but he was having to deal with this critique, and uh, you know, make you know, making clear, for example, that he believed in truth, uh, even though he was questioning a number of things that people saw as uh, as truths. Uh, yeah. but, uh, as I mean, there's no question. Uh, I mean, interestingly enough, in France, for the most part, deconstruction was actually marked as uh, as uh, very 1968. Um, later, it actually became uh, attacked as a kind of Heideggerianism, uh, and, and the critique was uh, both contemporary and not so, um, which actually uh, played on those associations. With uh, with Nazism uh, in America, as you know, that was very much uh, uh, in the United States. That was very much the association. Um, so much so that you could never quite figure out like is is the construction too much on the left? Is it too much on the right? And and though I am I'm, I'm I'm not convinced by something that we often hear, which is that if the left and the right attack you, that must mean that you're doing something uh, right. Um, we do say right, which is interesting in itself. But anyway. Uh, um, um, I do think that Derrida was 
uh, uh, very hesitant in, in kind of joining with, uh, uh, with groups. Like he, he was very much a man on the left, but he never joined uh, the Communist Party and in fact was very reticent to identify as a Marxist. And the point at which he actually started writing more explicitly about Marx was in fact after Marx was considered to be dead. And again, uh, what Mitchell has uh, been saying about Derrida's uh, kind of obsession with death uh, is very much uh, at work there as well. Like it's the moment when Marx becomes passé that Derrida goes like, well, let's think about this again, right? And let, let, let's make sure that we read Marx uh, precisely because his death may not be so uh, easy to read, uh, as it were. Um, but the attacks were, um, were uh, numerous. I don't know that they were particularly political. I think most people uh, who read Derrida seriously would certainly not disagree with the fact that he was kind of a left liberal. Um, but I, uh, I don't think that the label, the kind of activism, as it were, that he was uh, invested in, you know, the fact that he wrote very much against racism, he wrote uh, about Mandela, he wrote about Mumia Abu Jamal, that he was very invest invested in the struggle against the penalty. Um, he wrote about prisons. He uh, he was, you know, working together with Foucault, even at times when it seemed to be um, a difficult relationship. Um, there's no question that he was a kind of active intellectual and engaged intellectual in many ways, but he was also very reticent to be identified with a particular uh, uh, position on Israel-Palestine. Um, uh, he very much spoke uh, um, and understood, in fact, Palestine the Palestinian uh, 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 situation in terms uh, that were colonial, and yet he also made statements about uh, um, about Israel that um, for uh, for both for Zionists and anti-Zionists would be considered kind of too timid and too problematic. But um, so it 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 it's always complicated. Right? There's no question about that. Um, but but the the complication means also to kind of relate to politics. As something that is much messier than are you on the left or are you on the right? After all, we know this now. Uh, um, like I'm not sure what conservative means at a moment when you know uh, when the kind of devastation of uh, of existing institutions is uh, is ongoing. What what is a conservative that seeks to undermine the very basis on which this country, um, to some extent, was at least imagined? Um, if that's conservatism, I don't know what leftism is. But um, um, so I think Derrida would again be asking about the kinds of uh, um, political positionings that are recognizable to, to in order to to wonder how um, how more complicated it might be. One of uh, uh, one of the things that has interested me in his work was the way in which um, the the usual condemnation of Nazism as being this kind of you know, ultimate evil that is distant from everything that we know, and particularly from liberalism, was something that disturbed him very much. Because the collusion, in fact, between liberalism and Nazism, historically and ideologically, is not so very simple. Um, and of course, you know, one, uh, uh, one might get accused of banalization in, in a New York minute, but, uh, but this is something that he was uh, very uh, uh, concerned with. The, the, the ease with which one might vilify a particular side, terror, for example, terrorism after 9-11. He was very interested in asking, well, what's a terrorist? What is terror? How do we actually establish what an act of terror is? What a war on terror is? What terror is as opposed to war? Uh, yeah. Very difficult questions which put him kind of outside of the recognizable political spectrum, I think. Well, let me just end this interview, uh, giving you a few minutes to just wrap up your ideas about him. Uh, I want to just ask, since we're recording here in 2017, uh, where is Derrida now in the public consciousness, and where do you think he may be in the future? And then any other ideas you have, I'll, I'll start with Gil and then end uh, with Mitchell. So where, where, where does Derrida now stand both uh, academically and pop culturally uh, in Western thought? I mean, the most honest answer for me is I don't know. But uh, uh, but in his final interview, Derrida said that he was afraid of two things. He was afraid of having been read very well, uh, uh, meaning of having been read and therefore kind of being finished and done with. Um, and he was afraid as well of having not been read at all. 
um, which of course opened the possibility that one day he might actually finally be read. Um, and I kind of, uh, um, I may not be paraphrasing this completely accurately, but I kind of like this possibility that uh, we're done with Derrida because what he has brought us um, is something that, um, you know, is already kind of moving along, like Freud, right? Freud has been uh, dead for, for a long time, and he's been pronounced dead many, many times, and in many ways there's no question that he has moved, certainly our language, our way of thinking in all kinds of ways, uh, rightly or wrongly, in other words, we may not be orthodox Freudians, but in many ways we are all Freudians, we are all Marxists, because we all know that, you know, the economy, it's the economy stupid, right, is the most Marxist thing that Clinton could have said. Um, and it is a Marxist thing to say, even if it's not orthodox Marxist, or even, even if it's not complex enough. Um, so at some level, we're all Derridian now, um, and at another level, of course, we're not Derridian at all, because we have not begun to read him, and whether we have time to read him, I think depends on, you know, our, our esteemed president, and whether we have, you know, uh, much time to reflect on those issues. I can only hope that we do, but I'm not sure, you know, Korea, the environment, at this point, I'm kind of expecting the world to end at any minute. Um, but as I said, I'm a devolutionist. Uh, Mitchell, what is your take then on where we stand now, uh, both pop culturally and or academically, politically, on Derrida. I guess I, one of the things I am is an anti-declinist. So <laughs> we have different perspectives on these matters, and you know, you know, this, you know. So part of this is that I think Derrida is in the culture. You know, I think some of these strains would be in the culture without him. But I, I think we, the world looks more complicated. Again, this is hard to say with the current political situation, which seems in some uncomplicated way terrible. But uh, I, I do think in our lives, in my kids' lives, in uh, my friends' lives, there is more of an acknowledgement of complications. It's more of an understanding that, uh, uh, that simple distinctions need to be, need to be checked. And and I think he contributed to this. I think he was important in helping us understand this. And I think, you know, I, I, I hope what's coming across in this discussion is how hard he did, how hard he thought, how energetically he did these things. And he and I think he showed us, and I think you know the analogy to the revelations of a Freud or the revelations of a Marx, uh, you know whatever their limitations, is accurate here because it turned out when you read with this intensity, when you thought with this intensity, you saw things that hadn't been seen before. You had you saw things inside of a text defined broadly. That, that hadn't been apparent before. And in my view, that makes him a major thinker, uh, a major thinker of the late 20th and early 21st century. And, and I think his books are uh, filled with intelligence and in their ways, revelatory. And they're also difficult. And, and I think uh, I, I think they will survive, and I think their survival is connected, and their revelations and their intelligence is connected to ways in which I believe the culture is slowly, hesitantly going as an anti-declinist, I think are good. <laughs> well, I want to thank both. Yeah. Well, I want to thank both uh, Mitchell and uh, Gil for their thoughts uh, uh, on uh, Derrida, and I will link to their web pages below this video for anyone uh, who wants to find out more about them. So thank you again for spending uh, uh, some time with me. Thank you. Thank you both. It's been uh, fun. Thank you. Very nice to meet you online. We're neighbors. In, uh, we are. <laughs>